Stefano Tsitsipas took to Twitter to advocate for the legalization of on-court coaching in tennis. So I suppose it's a good time to rekindle this conversation. But before I do so, I just want to talk about the messenger himself. And then I'll get to on-court coaching, if it should be in tennis or not, at least in professional tennis, as it already exists in things like the Labor Cup and college tennis, and I think uh, with some success. But let me just let me just get to Stefano Tsitsipas, because what he is is the guy who shows up to a town hall. And at that town hall, they are discussing whether or not to raise the speed limit by 10 miles per hour on Main Street. And Tsitsipas shows up to the town hall, and he comes to the meeting, and he is advocating very staunchly for raising the speed limit by 10 miles per hour. And he's got eight points on his license already. He's got eight points on his license. So of all the people in the room to advocate for raising the speed limit, the guy with eight points on his license, that is the last person whose opinion should really be heard. And of all... Every Any single player I have ever seen on the ATP tour, there is nobody who I've found to be in more blatant violation of the no coaching rule than Stefano Tsitsipas and his father, Apostolo Tsitsipas, who is constantly, blatantly coaching Stefanos on the court on a regular basis. Not to mention that his coach, Patrick Maradoglu, at the Maradoglu Tennis Academy was the person involved in the most notorious coaching on-court coaching scandal in the history of the sport with Serena Williams in the U.S. Open final a couple years back. So of any player who gets to make their opinion heard on this issue, which is a, a, a valid thing to discuss and something that we should take to with open minds. Of, of all the people who can possibly throw out this suggestion, the very last person we should be really listening to is Stefano Tsitsipas. So I gotta I gotta acknowledge that. Again, I, I don't mean to I don't mean to hate on on Steph. Everyone knows that I've uh, I always give him a fair shake, but just uh, and and I admire so much so many things that he does on and off the court. But just on this particular issue, he's really one to talk. That that that's it. And I think that needs to be acknowledged. And now I will move on and uh, talk about the issue at face value because some people really do agree with it. Uh, most of the players I I don't think are on board. But I did see Billie Jean King uh, voice her support for Titi Pass's desire to to legalize on court coaching and I also saw some fans as well uh voice voice uh, their support for Titi Pass's suggestion but I got to say uh here's the best argument I think in favor of on court coaching in favor of legalization the best argument by far is that the rule as it currently stands is ineffective that it doesn't work and that there is a level of coaching being done between coach to player on the court in the majority of matches, between the majority of, of player-coach uh, dynamics, that, that normally there is some level of coaching being done. And a rule that is not being followed, a rule that is not being enforced, is by definition an ineffective rule. And any rule that falls under that categorization is one worth looking at, one worth looking at tweaking or perhaps abolishing. The best argument is that the rule is simply ineffective and it doesn't work. But you got to think about it a little bit deeper, and I have, I think, and I've come to this conclusion. I think you got to go back to speed limits. I think speed limits is a, is a perfect analogy for why the on-court coaching rule should not be dismissed as ineffective. It just shouldn't. We all know that if the speed limit is 55 miles per hour, um, that most of the cars on the road are going at least 60, maybe uh, maybe 65, maybe even 70. After that, you're speeding. But there's this general acceptance that if you're going 5 to 10 over, you're good. And not only that, but most of the cars on the road are going 5 to 10 over. 
maybe 15 over. It's just kind of accepted. Technically, the, the law as written is being is being broken at a very high clip. These cars on the road, they're all breaking the law. None of them are really listening to the speed limit. That is my experience on the roads. I am guilty of that myself. Every time I drive, I'm pretty much going over. A little bit. Five, ten over. I'm, I'll admit it. I'm guilty. I'm a felon. So does that mean, because most of the cars on the road are breaking the speed limit, does that mean that speed limits are ineffective, that we should just throw them out the win window, that they're garbage, that there shouldn't be a speed limit because nobody's actually following the speed limit? Well, you get where I'm going with this. No, no, of course not, because if there was no speed limit, if the speed limit wasn't 55, if you took that 55 away and you made it whatever you want it to be, We'd have cars going 90. We'd have cars going 85. People would be driving a lot faster. Faster for, for everyone's own good in the interest of public safety. So is the speed limit ineffective? No, that's not how all rules work. Not every rule is designed to be followed to a T. That doesn't mean it's ineffective. And I think that's true for the coaching rule. Yeah, there's a little bit of sign language going on, some third base coaching, some subtle coaching that's always happening on the court. But that doesn't mean that the no coaching rule is completely ineffective because I think without a doubt, if that rule was not in, in place, there would be much more blatant, blatant on-court coaching happening on um, in within tennis matches. And then... It brings us to the next question, do we want that? And is that the ideal in tennis? If you're asking me, the ideal in tennis is to have as little coaching as possible. I think that the beauty of the sport is that it is a true and pure one-on-one -on -one sport in, in at least in the singles format. And I understand in the team format, Labor Cup, college tennis, those things are great for their own reasons, but that is not... That is not a true singles format. That is not a true one-on-one -on -one format. And the true one-on-one -on -one format, which I always would like to be preserved at some level of the sport, I think that it is 100% worth our while as a sport to preserve that purity of the one-on-one. -on -one. And I know that as a young person, as a young person, as a child, that is something that attracted me to the sport, that agency, that competitiveness, that responsibility that I felt uh, when playing the sport, that it was going to be me deciding if I was going to win or I was going to lose. And there was not going to be a third party affecting the result of the match. This is mano y mano. And as soon as you really involve a coach, it changes that. And I, I always remember my proudest victories playing tennis are always instances where I problem solved and I figured something out. And by the way, that's character building. And it's one of the great things about playing this sport and just using match play as a mental exercise to, to make, to make yourself a better person is just the, the idea of fighting through adversity, figuring things out. That is always the win. Those are always the wins that are most rewarding for me. I'll never forget there's a match. It's not always tactical. I'll never forget there was a match where I was winning and then I got this terrible stomach pain and I could barely move on the court. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? And I, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't even jump up and down between points. So I'm like, look, let me try something. I stopped drinking water at the changeovers. Just stop drinking. I'm like, I'm just not going to drink anymore. And let's see if that fixes my stomach. It did. It did. I felt better. I came back. I won the match. I'll never forget that match. I don't, I don't remember any of the other matches at that tournament. I don't remember the next match that I, I think I lost. I, know, I remember nothing about it. I remember that one I won, though, because it felt amazing because I figured something out and I problem solved. Um, and I understand that that's not directly related to coaching, but th this is the... Again, the purity of the one-on-one, the -on -one, that is worth preserving in my opinion. That is one of the pillars of tennis. It's what makes tennis tennis in, in a certain way when it comes to singles. So 
I do think that's worth preserving. And the coaching rule helps preserve that. It does. And I know it's not perfect. I know that there's some coaching being done. Maybe the enforcement of the rule can be looked at because I mentioned at the top of this video that Stefano Tsitsipas is the worst offender of this. I don't know that I've ever seen him get a point taken away. I've seen him get, get, get a bunch of warnings, but think about that. I don't think I've ever seen him get a point. Maybe it's happened. I must have missed it. But that's the worst offender in the sport, never gotten a point. What does that tell you? This is not being enforced as strictly as it can. So maybe it's the enforcement that needs to be looked at, not abolishing the rule. And look, I'm all for ways to modernize the sport, ways to make the sport more accessible, ways to make the sport more popular, ways to make the sport a better television product. I love all of that. I want all of that. And traditionalism should never get in the way of anything that's going to make the sport more popular. But is this it? Really? I don't think so. The WTA has already experimented with this, with on-court coaching. And then the pandemic hit, and they took it away. And has anyone, has one person complained? Has one person said, oh, this, the pandemic is hard, you know, the fact that it took away the on-court coaching. I miss the on-court coaching. What happened to the on-court coaching? Nobody has said that. Nobody misses it. Nobody. Because it really did not serve the fan in the way that maybe we thought it would have. I would like the coaches to become a larger part of the television broadcast. I would like them to provide that access. But let's walk before we run. How about they interview between the set with the television rights holders. If we could just get an interview, that would be great. But now we're asking them to, to get mic'd up and to, to coach the player and to provide that level of access, which has, by the way, been tried in the NBA, the National Basketball Association, and there have been countless controversies with coaches being upset about what is and what is not put over the air. Yeah, I don't think tennis is ready to provide the kind of player-coach access that is going to improve the television product. Just don't think we're ready to do that. So that is not going to, I'll put it this way, bottom line, allowing on-court coaching is not going to unlock some key to tennis's mainstream uh, growth and popularity. Growth and popularity. It's not going to happen. And then the last argument I'll address that Stefano Tsitsipas floated out there that every other sport has it, and that is why tennis should have it. That is a brutal line of argumentation for just about anything. But I would say that's the best argument for tennis to preserve the no coaching rule. If this is something that distinguishes the sport and makes it unique, yeah, that's kind of the point here. That is an argument that isn't even worth entertaining because there's nothing there. Not going to make tennis more popular. It is unique. It is distinguishing. It is worth striving for that one-on-one -on -one ideal. And guess what? It's not entirely ineffective either. Let's keep the no coaching rule. And if anything, let's look at the enforcement of that rule and let's see how we can better abide by it. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.